to HeartTube. My name is Jim Putnam. I'm back with Tony Avent at uh, Juniper Level Botanic Garden and Plant Delights Nursery. Uh, they've had an open house this past weekend and, and got another one coming up uh, this weekend. Did you have a good crowd? We do, very nice, yeah. Oh, nice. Yeah, the gar garden's looking fantastic. I'm back over here for a third video with Tony. If you haven't watched the first uh, two, go back and watch, watch those. We're gonna cover some uh, shade ground covers. We covered hellebores in the first video, so we won't readdress hellebores, but um, there's an amazing collection of hellebores here, and they're mostly in, mostly up and blooming. They're in uh, full bloom, yeah. It's going to yeah. look great for this weekend. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, get, get over here if you can, um, in the, if you're in the Raleigh area, or it's, wor it's definitely worth the drive, uh, especially for a shade gardener. I mean, this is, you've got an incredible, you know, there's very few probably displays like this. Of, there's a lot going on right now. Yeah, yeah, there is. So. We're gonna get started on some shade ground covers with an expert, let's go. This is Rhodia japonica. This is uh, uh, called sacred lily of China, sacred lily of Japan. It's a fascinating plant because it's basically an evergreen version of a hosta. So hostas we know go down in the winter, the rhodias do not. So you've got this wonderful uh, form, comes in greens, comes in all kinds of variegates, comes in miniatures, comes in large. And then in the winter, it has these wonderful, wonderful red fruit which are just absolutely beautiful. So some of them stick up taller than others. As it gets late in the winter, they get heavier and begin to fall over a little bit, but just amazing all through the winter time. This is one of the many variegated rhodias. This is one of the speckled forms. So you have them with the bands on the edges, the bands in the center, and with speckle leaf. This is one called Miho no Matsu. Uh, from Japan, and so even without the fruit, you've got this wonderful variegated foliage that looks great all year. So you've created this beautiful stream, recirculating stream from your irrigation irrigation water. Exactly, yes. We wanted to capture all the runoff, all the irrigation water, and then make it into an ornamental feature. Right, and so that includes the two waterfalls uh, yep. that, that, that are here, plus this, this spot, and then you created where a, a path goes over it, and then the stream runs through and then there's amazing ground covers in this kind of dappled uh, shaded space, including Carex. Yes, we, we are lovers of Carex. And, and around a water especially, the weeping texture of Carex is just fits so well around it, the- uh, It does. The, the stream. Uh, this is one of the oldest uh, Carex uh, uh, in terms of being in American cultivation. This has been around since the 1970s. This is Carex Oshimensis Evergold. Okay, yep. It's not a new plant, but it's just as good as the day it was uh, introduced. It's, it's really fabulous. There, there are Carexes from literally all over the world. From almost every single continent, there are Carexes. We have American Carexes, we have Japanese Carexes, right. Chinese Carexes. They're, they're all fantastic right. in the garden. And the Everglades, if you go to the Everglades, that's Carex. They're Carex. <laughs> right, that's yeah, they're Carex in the water, uh, in the Everglades. Uh, do you cut all of yours back? Uh, we typically go in in spring, uh, say right now in March, and cut them to the ground if they have winter damage. If right. they don't have winter damage, this year it was a mild winter, we're not going to cut those. Yeah, that's what I, I demonstrated it. that at my house on some Everillos. Mm -hmm. I left yeah. them through the winter. They probably were fine, but I yeah. showed that you can cut them or not cut them. It's kind of it's, it's kind of your choice. Let's take a look at a couple that are yes. further down down the stream here. There's a lot uh, of things as we walk down. Here's another. This is the black mondo grass. So this is a a beautiful plant. We don't have a lot of truly black plants and this black mondo is just incredible and uh, you, you can do so many fun color combinations because it provides a different opportunity in the garden. Yeah and I think if people are concerned with mondo grass being mm -hmm. aggressive or some other ground covers being great. The black mondo is super slow growing. I mean, it's much yeah. slower to establish Yeah, itself. nursery people wish this were aggressive yeah, but right, uh, there's right. never enough of it so no it's not one that uh, that takes over. Right, right. And then you, so you guys put this log in across the we, stream and we, it planted into it. It did, full of the Carex Evergold. See how nice that looks? Uh, it just seems to fit right here around the uh, the water. And then we've used another clump of the rhodia that we just looked at uh, here by the stream. They all just seem to fit naturally into this area. Right, and, and there's hellebores over here. Like I say, we talked about mm -hmm. them in the other video, but they fit uh, into this space as well. Yeah, the other ground cover that uh, people don't think of as a ground cover is this right here. Now, it has to look like a liripe, but these are actually surprise lilies or hurricane lilies. They will totally disappear for about two to three months in the middle of summer and then 
July, August, the flower spikes pop up like little amaryllis of which they're cousins. But in the winter, it serves as an evergreen ground cover. They come up some in the fall, some in, in late winter. It, it, that's, that's amazing because I have, um, I want to come back later this year. I had no idea until we had a conversation the other day that collection of these that you actually have. It's, it, they're really amazing. Most folks know too, and uh, we've got about 700 different ones. So yeah, it's really quite incredible in the summertime here in the garden. Uh, this is a plant we simply love. I, I cannot imagine gardening without that. This is the evergreen Solomon seal. Uh, most people know Solomon seal, but they know the deciduous ones, which are absolutely wonderful as well. But this is actually in a different genus. This is the genus Diasporopsis. Uh, great tongue twisting name. This is Dosporopsis pernii. It's really only been in the country widespread since the early 80s. But what an incredible plant. This has come through the winter, the temperatures in the teens, absolutely no damage. It'll start flowering on the new growth here about early April with small white flowers, deliciously fragrant. It, you just can't beat this. This grows in really dark shade where very little else will grow. Uh, and I've seen it planted in my neighborhood in what we would call the hell strip, you know, out mm -hmm. by the road if you happen to have shade, really tough conditions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a tough plant. This is one of our native trilliums, and trilliums are a plant that really aren't grown enough. Uh, people go to stores and they buy dug stuff that was dug up north out of the woods, and they fail because that stuff will not grow down here, and much of it is dead when you buy it. But if you can get really good, well-grown, uh, nursery-grown, native trilliums from the deep south. A trillium fetidissimum from uh, uh, Mississippi, trillium ludovicianum from Louisiana, trillium maculatum from Florida, under Woody F from Florida. These are incredible. They're winter ground covers in the garden. They come up in February, they flower in February, March, and April. They're just absolutely wonderful. And look how great they look. They multiply, they will seed around actually in your garden. So if you get the right trilliums, they're incredibly easy in this region. One of my favorite uh, ground covers has got to be plant these. These are orchids. These are real, honest to goodness, evergreen, outdoor, in the ground, easy to grow orchids. Uh, this is what they look like through the winter time. They will be blooming in early to mid-March. They have spikes about this tall, colors ranging from whites to pinks to reds to oranges to yellows. Amazing colors. So, any calanthe that you can get for your woodland garden, definitely get that. So I had a nurseryman ask me if there were interesting plants out in the world that you know people weren't looking at. And immediately the very first plant that jumps into my mind is the fact that nurserymen grow one, maybe two cast iron plants. Uh, and how many are in this garden? How many different? Uh, we've got quite a few. I'd say in the uh, 70, 80, uh, different ones right now. Right. When we actually started collecting Aspidistras in 1980, there were only 20 known species to exist anywhere in the world. Wow. Today, there are over 200 wow. species. It's, it's amazing. And we see narrower leaf forms and wider leaf forms and um, super interesting. One thing is you're selling, uh, you know, quart pots a lot mm -hmm. of times, the variegations in the colors. Mm -hmm. It takes a little while, it seems like, in the ground. On some of them, yes. With anything, they have to mature. It's sort of the standard rule of, of perennials. The first year it sleeps, second year it creeps, third year it leaps. And right. that's really true on everything, true on aspidestrus. Give it wild, get its roots in the ground, then it starts growing. It's, it's too smart to start sending up a lot of leaves before it has established root system. What's your absolute favorite cultivar if you the one i'm standing beside right now whatever yeah. that one was i'll stand okay. beside a different <laughs> one you. in a few minutes but they're all <laughs> incredible this is aspidistria lady or this is one of the hardiest species it comes in solid green it comes in this beautiful yellow centered it comes in white striped it comes in white tips there's just so many cultivars just in that one species alone right do you go through and clean them up in the late winter, just take the old foliage out? Is we, that how you go about it? We, we do. What people have to realize is the leaves on Aspidestra last for three years. By year three, they're going to get looking really ugly. Yeah. So you've got two options. You can come in each spring and cut off the three-year-old leaves, and you're mm -hmm. starting to see some browning here. So that's what you would do. Just take that leaf off at the ground. The other option is to wait right before the new leaves come out and just cut the whole clump to the ground if that's easier. So you got two options equally as well. So we're standing next to 
um, to one that you actually introduced. We did. This was actually discovered by a friend of ours, Linda Guy, found this over okay. in China, and mm -hmm. we saw it, and we asked her if we could name it and introduce it, and she allowed us to. And this is Aspidistra Spectacular, spelled S-P-A-K, right. and it's uh, really starting to get out there now. It's just a but that's just a gorgeous plant. It just sort of screams at you from the garden. It is, and every time I see this one, I love how the leaves kind of bend over and show themselves mm -hmm. off. You know, they're not, you know, if they stayed up in this mm -hmm. kind of vertical position, you wouldn't see it. You well, that's the difference between the species we just looked at, Aspidistra ladyor, which all the leaves are up, and this, Aspidistra citronensis, that has a weeping habit. So it right. allows you to use it a different way in the garden. Right, so, okay, so how many plants have have you introduced through the botanic garden and the, and the nursery over the years or uh, been involved in naming and well, at the end of 2021 we were up to 1147 plants that we've introduced and i think 630 635 of those were actually developed here or plants we found on expeditions it's really an it's really an incredible it's really an incredible number uh you know you see uh your recall for this have you always had this kind of recall or is it just that you've said them to yourself yeah, enough yeah. times or is this just a natural ability to... It's a, we all have really odd gifts. So uh -huh. yes, I can tell you my grandmother's phone number that's been dead for 50 years. So yes, yeah, a number thing. Oh, okay, I got you, I got you. Not just the numbers, but just, I mean, re your recall of species. Well, as long know. as it's a plant, I can tell you its name. People, I'm no good at, but <laughs> right. plants, yeah, I got those. Oh, that's funny. There's an amazing number of ferns. Now, majority of them do die down in the winter, but there are some wonderful evergreen ferns. This is a particular one we like. This is called the upside down fern. This is Arachneodes standishii. And what, a, what an incredible plant. I mean, it looks a little rough in the winter time, but we will cut this back right before the new growth comes out here in the next uh, couple of weeks. And what's interesting about this, if you get the Chinese material, it's totally deciduous by mid-January it's to the ground but this Korean material from a different elevation stays looking good all through the winter. So here's another fern this is called bamboo fern and this is a particularly odd form because it has these uh, very interesting pinnae that are deeply lobed. Normally bamboo fern does not do that but I like it. It's typically very tardily deciduous and I say that here we are in in March, and it actually still looks pretty darn good, but we've only been to the teens this year. But bamboo fern spreads slowly, so it makes a wonderful ground cover uh, in the woodland garden. I just can't say enough good things about this, but it too, uh, in a, another couple of weeks before the new growth comes out, cut it to the ground, and then it'll re-sprout looking fresh. This is Jasper, and this we had Kit Kat in the first two videos, yes. and I didn't ever introduce Kit Kat. Oh, okay. And uh, people, you know, Kit Kat was the star of the show. So oh, I'm sure. We got Jasper in another part of the garden. Jasper, so come here. Come you're, here. You're on, Tony, whenever okay. you want to. This is another of those great evergreen ferns. This is holly fern, a very widely available plant. Uh, you see it growing a lot at the coast grows fine here inland, uh, just looks as good here in, in March as it does in uh, September, October. What a, what a great, great plant. It matures out about two feet tall and about four foot across. Another great evergreen ground cover that really is, is not known down here in the south, this is our native Pachysandra. Everybody grows the Japanese Pachysandra, which just doesn't do much for me. It's, it's a little too wild. But our native is really incredible. It has these wonderfully fragrant flowers here in midwinter. Uh, this cultivar is, uh, this is actually one of our introductions. We found this growing right outside of Angola Prison down in Louisiana, of all places, to botanize. And it's the earliest flowering of all. Most of them typically won't bloom for another couple of weeks. But you got this wonderful fragrance, you got this great mottled foliage. It's a, the spread is much more moderate. This is probably a 10, 12 year old clump and just excellent to cover some ground. So here's another of the Aspidistras or cast iron plants, but this one is a dwarf ground cover. This is Aspidistra zongbii. Uh, this is one that really wasn't even in the country until the mid 1980s, but what an amazing ground cover it is, whereas most of them are just a solitary clump, this one actually makes this beautiful mass. You can see sort of what the possibilities are to take a shady area. So many people, when they want to cover ground, they want to put in one plant instead of, or a or hundred of one plant, we'd rather put in a hundred different plants. We call that landscaping and drifts of one. Uh, it's much more interesting. 
So here we go, we've, we've, we go from the rhodius, which we've looked at earlier. Here's another beautiful one, the cast iron plant right behind that. An adult ivy here. We've talked about the uh, hardy orchid, the calanthe, the trilliums. And here we've got a woody ground cover. This is a false yew or cephalotaxis. This is prostrata, which means it runs all over the ground. Beautiful plant. Then we go into the wonderful acubus, which are amazing the fern here. This is Polypodium uh, vulgare. This is actually our collection from uh, South Korea. And we've got these beautiful arums. All of this combined together to make a lot more interesting. It, 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 we tell people it's, it's like inside your house. If all you had were a hundred green chairs, that wouldn't look very interesting. Your garden doesn't look very interesting when you do that. So think diversity. This is another great ground cover. It's a spring ephemeral, so it's going to disappear. It it's, comes up in the winter. This is our native cardamony bulbosa. This is a, it's a toothwort. It's native all through the southeast, native right here in North Carolina. What an absolutely amazing plant. Starts flowering around Valentine's Day not what people normally think of as a ground cover, but one we really need to integrate into our winter garden. A group of ground covers that we absolutely love are the wild gingers. Uh, many of those are native right here in North Carolina, but they're also native all through Asia, uh, one in Europe. Uh, this is the genus Acerum. Uh, the native people used to call them Hexastylus before we did the DNA and figured out they're all exactly the same. Beautiful foliage. Uh, this one is, has what we call a tortoise shell pattern many different patterns, some all green, and then they have these amazing flowers that flower mostly in the winter time that are just incredible. Just, just fabulous plants, look so good in the winter, but they'll reflush in the spring right after the flowers. It's always kind of hard to shoot these uh, woodland gardens because the sun is coming through, coming yeah, through the trees yeah. at, at funny angles and that kind of thing, but we, I think we've done okay this morning. We covered, you know. Covered a few things. We covered a few things, but there's a lot a lot to see here. I mean, we skipped over Farfugium. We skipped we skipped over a lot of things, uh, sedums that, mm -hmm. that we've seen. So it's worth a trip over here for sure on one of the uh, on one of the open weekends. And you got one more now, and then we you skip until spring. We do. We we've got this weekend coming up, and then we'll do it again the last week in April, first week in May. Right. Uh, so I'm going to be doing a uh, video um, um, at a at a at a friend's house who uh, does a lot of the stonework. Mm -hmm. uh, in here pretty soon. So I, I look forward to doing that video and then I'd like to come back later in the spring and see the garden at a different, at a different time. Sure. Sounds like a winter. Okay. Awesome. Thanks for watching guys.